Hey everyone, welcome to Kelly's Art Throb. I'm Kelly, and today I'm going to review some pencils that I got while I do this drawing. These are the Nick Pro 17 piece metal 2 millimeter mechanical pencil set, and it comes with a variety of pencil hardnesses. I'm going to remove it from the packaging while I tell you a little bit about this set. I like mechanical pencils. I don't like to have to sharpen wood case pencils. For a long time I've been looking for a set of mechanical pencils that come in a way that you can tell that one is softer than the other. A while back I'd gotten some plastic ones. They were plastic lead holders and they came in a variety of colors so that you could tell which one of them had the harder lead and which one had the softest lead. The problem with those were that I was always concerned I was going to break the plastic case. And the other thing was that they came in 3.2 millimeter, which was a little bit thick. This set popped up on my Amazon recommended list. It comes in a leather case, which does appear to be real leather and fairly well made. It has some colored leads, which I will never ever use. I guess some people like to sketch with colored pencils. I've never found that to be very helpful. Um, the case has pockets for all of the things that come in it. And it comes with a variety of different softnesses of pencil leads. It has 4H, 2H, HB, 2B, and 4B. Each hardness has its own case and the case has 12 pieces in it. The way you open the case is to push along the arrow. There's a flip top that won't open until you push the other part along the arrow. And that's a good feature to keep the leads from coming out. It's just a little security. I like these plastic cases. This set also comes with two erasers. One is a kneaded eraser. And I'll tell you now, I like the case that it comes in, but I don't like this eraser. It has a weird uh, sort of slimy feel to it. So I just took my piece of my own kneaded eraser and put it in there. The plastic eraser that comes with it is pretty good. And it comes with two, I don't know why two, it only needs one, but these are tip sharpeners. So as you wear down your lead and dull it, you can sharpen it if you need to get a point. There's also a little emery board. I prefer a regular uh, sand emery board to that plasticized one, so I probably wouldn't ever use it. And then there are five mechanical pencils. And as you can see, they go from white to almost black. And that's how you tell how soft the lead is. The pockets, everything appears to be well sewn in the case. The stitches aren't perfectly even, but they're secure. This is what the mechanical pencil looks like. It looks like a pretty standard mechanical pencil with a knurled grip. The first set of these that I ordered came with paint that was peeling off of the pencils, but the company sent me another set and the paint seems to be fine. I bought these pencils myself. I only contacted the company when the first set that I got was defective. Now it's time to use the pencils and see how they do. I'm going to do a portrait in the Strathmore Visual Journal. As usual, I'll list all of the supplies in the description. I will be using a reference photo from Unsplash. I'm using the 4H2 pencil in the basic shapes and components of the face. I don't want to add very much value, but I, I do want to get kind of a mapping out of what's happening. One of the things that I'm really enjoying about this set of pencils is the size of the lead. It's two millimeters thick. So unlike a regular standard size mechanical pencil that holds like a 0.5 or 0.7 or 0.9, or they even have smaller ones, you can't pull the lead out and use the side of it because it's too fragile, it's too thin. Whereas this two millimeter seems to be just the right thickness of lead to be able to pull that lead out and use it to, on the side to shade and also still get a nice fine point. In this white mechanical pencil, I'm using the 4H lead. These in this set are really nice because um, they're still light, but they're soft enough that they don't leave an indention in the paper. 
and they don't smear as much so it's it's a real sweet spot. I'm beginning to lay down some darker values with the 2B and the 4B and something that I found with the darker leads that I didn't like was that the graphite doesn't appear to be milled uniformly. So in certain parts when I was putting, when I was just coloring it in, uh, I, it felt like I hit some rough spots with the lead and it laid down a piece of graphite that was bigger than the rest of the graphite particles. And fortunately, I was able to pick it up with my Tombow Mono Eraser by just touching that little piece of graphite and picking it up. But I could see working in a small detail like the eyelashes or some part of the iris where that could be kind of a gotcha. And it's something you have to be aware of and take care when you're using the darker leads in this set. I really enjoyed using this set, even with the few um, issues with the soft, with the smoothness of the lead. I felt like I was able to uh, erase because a lot of the hair is putting down value and then erasing. Um, it was pretty blendable with the blending stump and a cotton swab. I really like this set and uh, I don't really hesitate about recommending it. And you guys know I don't do a lot of product videos because frankly I'm not that good at it and I think there's an art to it. But this was something that I have been waiting for for so long. Some, some kind of product like this because it makes drawing with graphite so much more accessible to me. And sharpening pencils is just a barrier to entry for me. Even with like colored pencils, I just hate it that much. I really do. Um, but this was very, these are very enjoyable to use, even with the little gotchas, with the, uh, the lead and the softer ones not being quite so smooth. It's still good, and I'm still going to use them. I was thinking about what I had been doing about this time last year, and I was picking up my drawing portfolio for my drawing class, and it made me a little lonesome for drawing with graphite. And that's when this set popped up on my Amazon recommendations, and I had to get it. I mean, cause why wouldn't I? I've been waiting, like I said, f for a long time for a product like this. And um, it's an opportunity to practice a skill set that I don't practice a lot, but I think is really valuable. Because when I think back to some of my favorite artists from history, like even the abstract artists like Pablo Picasso, or the surreal artists like Salvador Dali. They were very skilled, competent drafts people. They were able to render representational art very, very well. And I think it helped inform the rest of their art. I think it was a valuable part of their artistic development. So anyway, I'm sharing it here because I'm doing it and I'm also doing my channel and maybe this will encourage you to develop a drawing arts skill set as well if you're you know if you're into that kind of thing and now we come to the biggest challenge that I had with this drawing which surprised me the hair. I thought it was going to be the nose and the smile area and the mouth and the chin. That's usually what I have the most trouble with. But in this case, it was the hair. And as women, we have spent a lot of time on our hair. We know how our hair grows. We know how our hairlines, uh, I guess, lie. Um, we, we just know how it moves and, and how 
I don't know, the structure of the hair is the easiest part for me to draw normally. But I have to remember that most of the time when I draw portraits, the hair is groomed. And in this case, the subject is outside and it's apparently windy because her hair is windblown. So part of it is very smooth and part of it is stringy. And there's even one portion of her hair that's from one side and it has blown over the top of her head. And I gotta tell you, it was challenging. It was hard. The thing about it is the stringy part, you have to be, you have to take almost more care with the stringy parts than with the parts that are groomed and soft and put together because it can look really sloppy and like you just kind of gave up and it's challenging. I found it hard. And one of the things that really surprised me was that I felt like I was really growing as an artist because when you address something that is normally easy for you, or I wouldn't say easy, but it's harder than usual, you can get frustrated. And I found myself in this sort of dialectical where part of me was extremely frustrated and, and I would just have to get up and walk away. And then the other part was it was challenging enough that sometimes I would get into a really good flow state and that's like the most blissful thing ever is to, and I've been researching on how to get into flow state. And the main thing is that you're doing something that challenges you enough that it requires your full attention, but it's not so hard that you can't do it. So I was like, I was on this teeter totter existence of, wow, I'm in the zone and all of a sudden something would happen and it looked, it just ruined what I was working on. And then I would have to get up and like, at one time I got up and went and folded laundry. And another time I went and watched a movie with my husband, but then I would come back and having been just like, I don't even, have I bitten off more than I can chew here? And then I get, no, you haven't. You've been doing portraits. You used to do portraits all the time. You can do this. And then I would sit down and settle down and put on my earbuds and put on some music and go back into it and pick it back up. And it was okay. But it was a very interesting it's very different than doing like a watercolor, you know, color study or something like that. It's just a whole different thing. Can you hear where my air conditioning went back on? <laughs> I'm trying really hard to just record when the air conditioning's off, but then that interferes with my flow of thought. And Maybe that's a little more important than hearing um, a little bit of a hum in the background, I hope. So I started thinking, how am I going to do the rest of this video? Because there are hours and hours. <laughs> I spent a long time on this portrait, as you should when you're doing something that is challenging for you. And so I don't want to come across like I'm some expert graphite portrait artist. Obviously, I, I need to do a lot of work before I can claim that title, but I like, I like the way it turned out. And, um, oh, I, I, even wearing gloves, I eventually I had to, I had to try, put on a different pair of gloves because I got so much graphite on them. But, um, and I found that I was smearing a little bit with the, with the darker leads. So, you know, all those things that you, if you don't do it all the time, you sort of forget and um, pulled out my drafting, I don't remember what you call it, it's a, it's a brush, it's like the dusting brush. I pulled that thing out so that, you know, I could dust the crumbs of my eraser off way back from drafting class. I still have that thing. And um, 
anyway so I think what I'm going to do for the rest of this I'm I'm voicing it over as I'm watching it and trying to figure out exactly how how to do this video and I'm sorry I apologize I hate it when youtubers and I cringe when I go back and look at some of my old videos where I'm I'm feeling unsure of how to do the video so I apologize for that but it's just the way it's got to be for this video so I'm gonna I'm I'm just gonna you know edit in parts of it that I think are relevant and I'm gonna do it pretty much at um, real time because otherwise it looks jerky and weird and it just this kind of drawing to me does not uh, render very well when you speed it up so bear with me on this if you're still watching you must really like graphite portraits and um, thank you so I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this hang on and I'll be right back okay I know what I wanted to say about the hair this part of the hair and well the whole hair really what I found the best way to do it instead of trying to draw the hair especially because she's blonde I think it would be different if she had dark hair but because she's a blonde it seemed better to uh, just draw on the basic shapes of the hair at the strands and then fill it in with value and then go back with an eraser and pull out the highlights and then draw with a pencil any shading around each strand, each group of strands. Also, because the light was so diffused, there weren't a lot of shadows of, that cast by the individual strands of hair. A lot of times in a portrait, when um, small strands of hair are sort of apart, and maybe they're close to the head, they sort of cast shadows on whatever's underneath them. And it helps to really give it dimension and pull out detail. But the light in the, in the image that I used was so diffused and her hair is so blonde and her skin is so fair, there really weren't a lot of shadows. I had to almost imagine the shadows and draw them in if that makes sense in order to give some definition so it was almost like an art an artifice an artificial way to give the hair dimension that wasn't really there in the picture but mm, because it was a photograph and it was color it was a little different I don't know maybe I should have made the the photo the reference photo grayscale since I was doing um, graphite but I didn't really want to do that something else that happened over and over would be that um, I would tweak a detail of the hair or some other part of the drawing and because I could see that there was just something slightly off so I'd go to correct it and then it would it would take it too far or it would be the wrong something the, the, whatever I was trying to achieve didn't work and then I would have to erase what I had just done plus the stuff that had been working most of the way well and just go back over it again and I'll say one thing for this paper the Strathmore um, mixed media journal it's a hundred percent cotton I don't think there's any sizing in it but it was pretty tough it took a lot I mean it didn't I didn't over the work the paper while I was doing that which just really amazed me and I like this I like the paper in the sketchbook and I like the sketchbook itself for doing YouTube videos because it doesn't take up that much space on the desk and uh, I, I really do prefer the sketchbooks that I make myself but I have determined that I really like a large sketchbook like 9 by 12 so when you open that up it takes up so much space on the desk it's not really practical for YouTube videos this this is a really good compromise 
That m might be TMI, if so, sorry. I, I told you guys that because I want you to understand why um, I'm using whatever supply I'm using, and that's why I'm using that sketchbook, this sketchbook. And though the plastic eraser that came with this is good, um, it's good for overall erasing, but in order to get fine detail, I like the Tombow mono eraser. Uh, the one thing I don't like about it is that it builds up a lot of, I want to call them eraser boogers. <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I, you know, you constantly have to like pick off those little places on it. And uh, my general facti my general pencils factice eraser does it too, but not quite as much, but it's also not as thin. So I have a monitor because uh, that's the only way I can see what's happening on camera because my camera monitor is so tiny. So the interesting thing is that my camera records upside down because the way it's mounted. So <laughs> the only way I can see what I'm working on, the direction it's going to be seen eventually. Well, it's weird. It's just like my monitor sees things upside down. So when I turned this upside down, I could actually see it in the monitor right side up. At least that's how I recall it. So yeah, I'm working on the face again a little bit and I'll show you in the end, I'll show you the uh, comparison between the reference photo and the drawing that I drew. But I made her eyes significantly narrower than she had really big eyes in the photograph. But I'm, I kind of wondered if they didn't do a little photoshopping or tweaking of the girl's face because most people's eyes are not that close to the side of their head. So I took a little bit of uh, artistic license and made her eyes a little closer together. But, um, or I should say, not quite as, the eye itself, not quite as wide. Anyway, um, I decided I had made it a little bit too narrow and I went back. And I, I must have reworked these nostrils five or six times. And like, there's like a little reflection on the nose underneath the nose. And without it, it just looks like they have a dirty nose. So you have to get that really, really accurate. And something else I have to say is regarding the pupils in the eyes. If you don't get the pupils just right, I mean, they, they have to be both the same size and the reflections have to be just right. And the pupil position has to be in just the right position because even a tiny variance makes it look like there's something wrong. Like we're so familiar with the human face that if something's off even slightly, we notice it immediately. And so, yeah, no, no dirty noses and no off pupils. All right, I'm going to work on the hair a little bit again. And this is part of that tricky part here because as the hair gets further from her face, it becomes stringier and stringier and more and more windblown. So um, I'm adding some value and then I'm going to pull out highlights. And basically, I'm just going to keep reworking that hair until I get it right. The closer it is to her head, the easier it is to do because it's it's more together and less lots of individual strands but there's still a lot going on here because it's so windy she's outside and it's a windy day so i'm just adding value in between to define the larger strands of hair 
as they're as they're dividing. The values are all relative, so as you adjust the value in one area, you realize that, or I realize, that I needed to adjust it around her face. It's always easier to add more value and make it darker than it is to pick up a lot of graphite. So I always err on that side, you know, put a little less value down and then add to it as I need to. I just keep moving from the face to the hair and then, you know, the hairline at the top was bothering me. It needed more detail. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where I ended up having to redo that whole hairline. And it was very sad because I had it 98% correct. And I just started messing with it a little bit too much. Now I'm going to rework that hair at the hairline a little bit. I'm going to add in some value at the, at the roots and just give some overall dimension to the hair a little bit. I sped this up just a little bit because it was okay to, it looked okay what I did. Um, so I'm going about twice as fast in the video than I actually did. Since we're pulled a little further back and we're almost done with this, I sped this part up about five times. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just adding some dimension and some value down here in the sort of, I like to call it the string section <laughs> because it's where the hair has been the most windblown and it's, it's more stringy. So part of her jacket is showing through from behind and part of it is just, you know, part of the hair being underneath other part of the hair. Something interesting that came out of this was I had enough graphite on my little blending stump that in some cases I was able to add just exactly what I needed as far as kind of a faint blended line um, on some of the blank pieces of paper, parts of the paper. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. So have any of you made it out to see the Barbie movie? Um, I talked about that in my last video and I just want to touch on it briefly because we did go see it. And I have to say, it was not at all really what I was expecting. And there were some parts of it where I actually felt pretty emotional, which surprised me. I, I mean, I really didn't expect to go in and be like moved or anything like that, but there were a couple of spots where it was surprisingly emotional. So I'd be interested to see if in the comments, if any of you felt that way too, without spoiling it for anybody. I decided that this Paint. This picture needed a background. I wanted a background behind her and I just happened to have some powdered graphite that I got last year while I was in school and I haven't done a lot with it. I did more with the powdered charcoal that I got. Um, but I decided to pull the, the powdered graphite since this is a graphite drawing. Um, I thought I'd use it instead of the powdered charcoal. Anyway, it's Creta Color. I got it at Dick Blix. I'll put it in the description. And I have this watercolor brush, uh, a watercolor brush from um, Royal and Langnickel. It's their Menta line. And I like it so well. I wanted to get another one because it's so soft and it's really good for painting in a powdered like a pigment but unfortunately they don't I don't think they make it anymore I haven't been able to find it but it I literally just brushed this it was like using dry watercolor in a way 
you know, powdered dry watercolor. That's what it felt like. And, um, you know, it's not a real even background, but it's not supposed to be. Kind of reminds me of those backgrounds that they used to put behind you when you took school photos. That's kind of the consistency of the background. All right, well, we're just about to the end of this. I want to thank you for hanging with me this long, especially since it's not something I normally put on my channel. And I also want to say thank you so much for all the likes, subscribes, and comments. You guys are awesome. The channel's growing, and it's all because of you. Anyway, here's the reference photo and the final drawing. You guys take care, and thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Bye.